Good morning, and welcome to Virtual Praise. Sit back now and incline your heart so that we may worship God together. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. When it is grown, it is a very large shrub. God's transforming love begins in small ways to enter our hearts. Lord, sometimes we wonder about you. We look around us at the mighty power and majesty of nature, and it is easy for us to sing songs of praise for your creation. Lord of preparation and transitions, we are already halfway through our summer months. We sit and wonder where the time went did we spend it well in your service? Give us these next few weeks for renewal that we may be prepared to work through your church for your world. Keep us mindful of the needs of family, friends, and others, that we will be your faithful disciples. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Diligent Lord, who watches over us at all times, be with us all these days. We confess that we have allowed a host of worries and frustrations to crowd out your word for us. As you give us peace and your transforming love, also forgive all those times when we have been less than faithful disciples. Gently visit us again with your healing powers. Restore our hope and courage and joy for all the times ahead. 
We ask this in the name of the Master Healer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, receive this assurance of pardon. Here is some wonderful news. While we were worrying and fretting, God has been at work in our lives offering healing and peace. Receive these gifts in the name and love of the Lord our God. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Hear these words. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might from be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Lord of mustard seeds and yeast, we come to you this day seeking your word and will for us. Make us people who care deeply about the well-being of others. Give us courage to be yeast for the rising of hope and peace throughout the world. Open our hearts to your redeeming love. We come, our hearts and spirits, open to your love and your presence. Amen. Would you go with me to the Lord now in prayer? God of surprising love, you have called us to be your treasures, to be those who love and serve you by helping meet the needs of others. Jesus reminded us that we were like mustard seeds that could grow into mighty shelters for those who felt abandoned, that we were like yeast placed in flour, which causes the whole dough to rise and to be fruitful for the nourishment of God's people, that we are also nets cast into the unknown sea, gathering people for the Lord that they might be healed and saved. You place so much hope and trust in us Please help us not to fail you. We bring before you this day persons and situations which need your healing love. Help us to be vehicles of that word for these dear ones. Give us courage and empower us to serve you boldly and joyfully. For it is in the healing love of Christ that we offer this prayer. Amen. And now, let us lift up to God the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Here now is the Gospel of St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 13, verse 31. Hear this word of the Lord. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds can perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant 
looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. The word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord. May your word be proclaimed either through me or in spite of me. I ask in the name of the living Christ. Amen. Last week, we went through steps 7 and 8. You may recall that step 7 was about how we should use a spiritual gifts inventory as a tool to create opportunities for spiritual growth and new disciple making. And recall that, that step number eight was all about effectively communicating our expectations, it's which, all of which leads us to step nine. Here's how it is written. We are committed to accountability and self-honesty as a model for Christian problem solving so that we may prayerfully address the root causes of our organizational challenges. There's a lot here. I will work at it from the end back to the beginning. The end talks about our goal. What is our goal? It is to address the root causes of our organizational challenges. We must understand what led to the challenge in the first place. How we do that is by adopting a model for Christian problem solving. Now Christian problem solving is organically somewhat different from secular problem solving that you might see in a business. Christian problem solving is not solely about finding a solution, at least not explicitly. In large measure, it is about the human dimension of our organizational challenges. So, in problem solving in a Christian way, we are required to follow a simple guide, especially whenever we encounter a problem that affects the entire organization. And here are those three easy steps. We must prayerfully reflect on what circumstances led to the problem in the first place. That is the root cause. Prayerfully reflect on that. There, there is no action taken yet in there. That is the importance of the prayer. Next, we move on to humbly respond especially if there is an urgent need to take action. And whether that action is urgent or it is something that can be done in a more reasoned pace, the fact that you are responding then, not at the first step where we're doing the reflecting. We're trying to make sure we understand before we act. And here's the part then that a lot of organizations don't follow through with. And that is that we must inspirationally revise the circumstances, the conditions, under which the problem came about in the first place so that we do not repeat it. So how does accountability and self-honesty go from being a slogan 
to being the normative foundation for Christian problem solving. Well, you shouldn't be surprised, but we now need to walk the talk. Are you committed to accountability? Has the phrase, I was wrong, become a vital part of your nomenclature? How readily do you admit a mistake or a shortcoming? Do you quickly react with defensive language and defensive attitude? Or do you instead listen carefully as someone describes the situation and how they see the challenge being resolved? Friends, there isn't any real difference in these lessons than there were in, when we were taught as children how to problem solve. Remember, we were told that fibbing or exaggerating or outright lying can become unmanageable very quickly when one lie begets another and another and another, etc., etc. Soon it becomes impossible for us to remember what lie we told to who. Sometimes, however, the person that we are lying to is ourself. Because we're convinced that we've done nothing wrong. Our defensive and defiant attitude is used to deflect rather than to accept something that we've done has potentially caused harm to another of God's children. So what are some of the ways in which people lie in church? Well, if you exaggerate a reason why you haven't been to church in a while, I have been so busy, so many things, whatever, fill in the blank, I just have to ask, do you think that that self-deception is going to fool God? How about when you use a disagreement with someone or perhaps with some polity of the church as cover for not leveraging Christ's teachings about forgiveness and love in order to clarify and articulate how you really feel. What about if you get mad at the pastor because the pastor says something that you find objectionable? So you begin to undermine the pastor in an effort to convince them that they should ask for a change. You see, lying and exaggerating in the church family, it is less about seeking advantage than it is about dodging accountability. Such small concerns become a self-imposed prison sentence. Rigorous self-honesty is the only key that will open the cell that we have built around ourselves when we are facing organizational challenges. And now moving on to step 10, and it reads like this. We understand that stewardship is much more than tithing, and we are teaching our families and staff what the full spectrum of responsibilities and accountability of Christian stewardship is. This, my friends, is the most uncomfortable sermon to preach or the most difficult lesson to teach because nobody likes to talk about faith and money. We get squeamish just mentioning tithing or pledge cards or those weeks or months when we were out of town and our financial commitment to the local church went with us to the beach. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the car that we drive, the neighborhood we live in, the clothes that we wear, and the places that we go on vacation speak volumes about how we prioritize in this life. Those are the things that we are most proud to display. But a conversation about how faith and our financial support for the church intersect, well, that is generally considered off limits. Perhaps it is that we simply get confused about the vocabulary that we use. Tithing is the preservation and distribution of one-tenth of someone's net worth. 
Whereas stewardship, which is what this step is concerned with, stewardship is the act of caring for items that possess value in someone's eyes. Could be yourself, could be someone else, could be a group. You see, when we talk about tithing, you can be assured that the conversation is about our financial or monetary commitment to meet the goals, that is, the budget, to support operation of the church. Now, the conversation that we might have about stewardship, it has a tithing element to it, uh, to be sure, but the cash, that isn't the focus of the act of stewardship. See, stewardship is an all-encompassing force within the ministries of the local church. It's not just about paying for repairs and maintenance. It's about thinking and planning strategically about the changes in the buildings and grounds that may become necessary or may become desirable sometime in the future. It's not just about safeguarding our preferred means of worshiping, but considering the diversity of worship models and styles that are out of our comfort zone. And stewardship is not just supporting the outreach of the church, but helping to identify and quantify what the next right thing to do might be. These are all examples of what we mean by stewardship because it is about our consumption of resources to meet needs. But it's also about laying the groundwork for future generations of Youngsville Christians by taking steps today to provide for the anticipated needs yet to come. Stewardship is really about the future, how we enable it, how we defend it, how we sustain and grow it. Stewardship applies to every touch point in the church. Volunteering to serve on a committee is stewardship. Agreeing to lead a committee is stewardship on steroids. Lending your expertise to a team or an individual who might want to avoid making the mistakes that you made and lived through they might want to hear your experience. That is stewardship. Leading worship, not just attending it, that is stewardship. Constantly remaining active in our prayer life, not just when it is convenient or when we remember. All of that, all of those examples are all stewardship. When we take the dimension of accountability and we join it with the stewardship conversation, what we find is that our openness to imagining a better life for and through the church is fully dependent upon our willingness to be accountable for what has already happened in the church along with what is yet to be. It is fundamentally understanding that those who practice accountability and self-honesty make far better Christian stewards than anyone whose piety is always on display. Amen. of great trial, of famine and darkness and sore. Still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on a cloud, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call.
are the days of Ezekiel The dry bones becoming as flesh And these are the days of your servant David Rebuilding a temple of praise And these are the days of the harvest The fields are all white in the world and we are the laborers in your vineyard Declaring the word of the Lord Behold He comes Riding on a cloud Shining like the sun At the trumpet call Lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee And out of Zion's hill Salvation comes Behold He Riding on a cloud, shining like the sun At the trumpet call, lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes There is no God like Jehovah there is no God like Jehovah, 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 behold he comes riding on a cloud. Shining like the sun At the trumpet call Lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee And out of Zion's hill Salvation comes Behold He comes Riding on a cloud Shining like the sun At the trumpet call Lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Now receive this benediction. Go forth with joy, celebrating all the many ways for us to serve our Lord. Give us courage, hope, peace, and love that we might bear these gifts to others. Go in peace, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.